cost of governance should begin with cuts from the executive, so says the National Assembly. And the PDP moves to reconcile its leadership conflict in the Southwest. This is Plus Politics. I am Coyote Ladendi. Welcome back. This is Plots Politics. The National Assembly has advised that for Nigeria's cost of governance to be reduced, more attention needs to be paid to the executive arm of government. The House of Representatives had specifically asked that cuts be applied to the executive and not the legislative arm. This was stated by Benjamin Kalu, the spokesperson for the House of Representatives. He stated that the legislative arm occupies 0.8% of the entire budget. To elaborate more on these, we have joining us uh, Shegun Akabashorun, who is a political analyst. Good evening, Shegun Akabashorun. Yes, good evening. And yeah. good evening to Nigerians. Yeah, good evening. Good, good to have you. And also, we'll Sorry. be joined by uh, Jide Benson, who is a public affairs commentator. Good evening, G.D. Benson. Okay, I understand they will join us any moment soon. But let me start with Shegun Akabashiru. Now, this seems to be like, um, you know, uh, uncharted territory. We are used to telling the lawmakers that, oh, let's have courts in your alliances. Sometimes we even recommend that we should have unicameralism rather than the upper chamber and the lower chamber. Now, coming from them to say that, please put your such light on the executive. What do you think to this, about this call? Well, um, it's, uh, it's, it's very funny that this is coming at this time, in this year, after the much needed cry for reduction in the cost of uh, governance has been ongoing for decades now. And we have thought, after uh, successive governments in, in this, this, this democratic dispensation that we have started in, 1990, in 1999, that up till now, we have not been able to achieve that. Unfortunately, coronavirus, the pandemic came into uh, 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 our reality suddenly and the need for us to have a reduction in the cost of governance became imminent and the gov people in government never attended or never initiated to see that they, they need to, to, to tighten their belts first internally before you cannot ask for uh, assistance from from international community and, and, and well wishers that want to donate. However, none of that was done, and even the palliatives that people and international community donated to our government to give as palliatives to their people were wrongfully handled. So, if this is coming from our national assembly, that is now saying the cost of governance. We are interested in talking about it, but first of all, that the, the, the executive arm of government must first address, first address before they should address it. This shows the political rigmarole that is usually seen in sound bites that our politicians are used to in presenting to the general populace to make us believe they are trying to do something or they are working so hard, this is moving in circle without any meaningful motion to, to, to anywhere specific. Yes, so so this is the situation where I'll, where I'll come back to, to you. I'll come back to you where I will ask some more pointed questions because I'm, a, I'm aware you're privy to some direct information. Sorry, I will have to put you on the spot. But let me talk to G.D. Benson to get his opening remark. Uh, listening to Benjamin Kalu, he did say that uh, this is just, uh, using his word now, just 0.8% of the entire budget. 
Why don't you put your search light on the executive? And I'm asking, what do you have to say about this call? Well, thank you for having me again, Cardi, and good evening, viewers. Uh, Benjamin Kalu does a good job as a spokesperson of the House of the Green Chamber. And of course, um, in trying to parry, in trying to parry attention from the House of Reps, I don't think he has done this well. However, I agree with him. Um, don't forget that um, our democracy is, what, 21 years old this year. And so we've not always known about the legislative arm of government or what it's supposed to represent. So we're just coming to um, grips with that. Um, the first Pandora's box that was opened regarding the remuneration of the members of the National Assembly was when under the NYRM and Buhari leadership, they were to receive 2.5 million and 3.5 million Naira allowances for, for their furniture. This was in 1999. And that was what um, <clears throat> led to an outcry. I quite agree with him that the executive, arm, that is such likely to be beam on the executive arm of government as well. For instance, in the budget defense that has been happening in the past few weeks, I mean, we have seen the allocation to several arms of the executive arm of government. For instance, the presidency, 19 billion naira, about um, 1.9 billion for the Asurok Villa, which the wife of the president has told us that cannot even cure basic ailments, that they lack as little as Panadol. And you can imagine that that allocation is an annual basis, or is on an annual basis. Don't forget that there was a time that the amount for cutlery was humongous. I don't know of any household where cutlery is bought every month, whether it's fork or spoon or knife or plate or tumblers. So you can imagine what the civil servants and officials in the presidency will be doing with such allocations. I would also agree with him because um, there are certain agencies of government that have no business existing or some are duplicated, but we don't dwell on these things. For instance, there's a ministry called Ministry of Special Duties. I don't know of any duty that is special that does not fall under transportation, education, finance, environment, transport, aviation. So that's for me again, is a cost center. Hmm. So we focus a lot on the, on the House of Representatives and the Senate. That's not to say that they are not receiving sacrilegious allowances, but if he's trying to get us to also be in the searchlight on the executive arm of government, I think he's done a good job of that. Okay, th th thank you for that. And it therefore means that both of you are on the same page. So back to you, Shegu. I'm asking question, you know, um, a part of the things uh, in, in, in addition to what G.D. Benson did say, is the fact that uh, Sheo Sani mentioned their take home for salary probably was not magnanimous enough to also tell us the allowances where even for the take home there was outcry. And that brings us to why a lot of Nigerians are totally indifferent about the budget. They seem not to show interest because it's all about some selected few. And when you are talking about the capital project that should directly affect them. We are talking of less than 20%. And at the end of the day, we hardly have up to 10% budget performance. So how do we change this narrative that when it is time for budget, people can really show interest that, oh, something is about to be done. Something is about to be done that will affect you and I. Well, um, what I've said is that this is a distraction. The distraction is when one chamber is pointing to the other chamber that you do this first uh, before we, we, we have a rethink or we have a presentation of our position of what kind of costing or kind of reduction we can have in, in, in governance. Now, the, the reason why I'm being, being objective to what they have said is that we've seen that politi in our political discourse, what we always have is discussion without action. Because the action is where the problem is, and that's why people are disenfranchised and dissatisfied with our politicians when they talk about changes that are meaningful. Yes, we want good governance, but our problem with good governance and where we can change the narratives is that the people that represent us, that, 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 that pretends to present issues on our behalf, are really not there to serve our interests. So if you're going to talk of good governance, we should talk of how in the future, 
where people who are going to be elected or so stand for election will be able to stand by a, a policy or a position that, for instance, that I stand by a re specific reduction in the cost of governance. That is the mandate by which I am. I wanted to be elected, and these are the things. These are the ways. These, these are the ways we can have meaningful change. That people who have proposals that are in the interest of the populace, because any of this reduction, they are saying, nobody has. None of the chambers have, have made any radical uh, proposal of what kind of um, reduction we are talking of in the first place. So we don't even know whether it's a it's a zero zero point one. Uh, uh, a reduction is that they are talking about. So we find this uh, as lip service because this should have been done five, ten years ago. We need to tighten our belts. We need money. We need funding. There are so many infrastructural deficits. Where do we start from? Charity begins at home. Our leaders should take the lead. And no, none of them has shown anything meaningful for us to take them seriously. Because we're just going to have a political debate. That's all. Okay. Uh, let me stay with you before I go back to GD. Some of the things I've heard uh, um, the lawmakers did say, because since you're putting both of them in context, is yes. they will remind us that it's not in their hand to have their salaries reduced. That probably the uh, revenue and mobilization, that's the agency involved. So where should, don't you think we should direct our advocacy to this agency or what is the way out or is another way of who, 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 who's the voices or is it the voices of the of the ordinary masses that is going to be where they are or the voices of those who are there at leadership at the echelon of the, of the leadership of this country whose voices are going to be where they are who are directly involved i mean what excuses they, they, they keep giving us excuses and this is the frustration that the masses of the undereducated people that this kind of behavior has created, that we are not having solutions to. So we need to have a, a meaningful and serious rethink. If we are going to do this, let's do this holistically. Yes, it is not just about the, 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 the other chamber. Yes, the executive and the judiciary. It's, yes, we need, we need it in the police force. We need it everywhere. Is okay. That the local government, whether it's the state government, there's the same problem we have. Okay. Uh, uh, let me, the, 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 so it's a general problem. Let me also take this question to GD Benson. I, I'm looking at how do we make sure that this is not another talking, sh I mean, talk shop, this is not another debate that we are having, that we can make a headway. This is a platform where we can push this advocacy. What do you think about that, you know, you call it hint? from the lawmakers that they cannot reduce their salary by themselves. Yeah, he's right. Uh, but again, he's being economical with the truth. Uh, because even the budget of the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission must be approved by the National Assembly. Interesting. So if the National Assembly has to approve the budget of the RMAFC, and their own allowances have been reviewed. You can bet, or you can you can imagine what would happen to the allocation that is due to the RNAFC. Uh, but I think that we'll continue to go back and forth on it until we start to see sincerity on the part of both the executive arm of government and the legislative arm of government. Sadly, um, the legislative arm of government has not been able to do PR for proper public relations to get the public to know what they do with the allowances that they receive. No member of the legislative arm, not the Senate, not the House of Reps, not in this assembly, not in any of the previous assembly, has been able to stand before his or her constituents to say, this is the entire amount I receive on a monthly or quarterly basis. Except for, thank God for organizations like Budget that are giving us a glimpse of what they earn. And then there's the principle of legislative solidarity that seems to bind them all together. Oh, I think there's a bit of network issue there. Legislative solidarity, that, 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 that brings up another issue, Shegun Akaba Shorun, and yes. that has to do with an issue that I find quite impossible, if you pardon me to express myself. What I'm saying is, 
Is it likely to see people say, I want to have a pay cut? Is it possible for our politicians or you yourself to say, let me reduce my money? Don't you think there must be a superior you know, advocacy or a kind of thing? Because oftentimes we also blame the presidency for not coming up with this slash. How do we achieve this? Well, they say you can't give what you don't have. Exactly. We have to go back to party politics. And this is the basis of where good governance can start. Because we, are, we have to go for where the political class are being trained and incubated. Where they are being churned out from. The colleges and the school of training they go to. It's all in their political process, the party system. And this is what is lacking. That is why the masses of the ordinary Nigerian are being filtered out of the process. Because you have godfathers and godmasters of political parties that strangle all this and dictate those who will get to the echelon of power to make changes. So we have to go back to party politics in which the ideology of the party become the basis by which membership are brought in. So, so this is where the, the problem is. Good governance must start from the ability of, of a majority of people being having the free chance to say that this person should represent us because this is the best person that will deliver our, 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 so our, what do you, our, what do you explain from those colleges that you alluded to? Are you saying that uh, they should start yes, teaching them the, about servant no, no, leadership? No, 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 yes, well, well, in that line. But one of the things we want to say is this, a simple message. The rule of law is paramount. Now, if their political parties have rules of laws, we have, we have guidelines, we have party constitutions. What is unfortunate is that these God of fathers do never, never follow any of the constitutions. We all saw what happened in the congresses of the, of the top political party in this country, be it PDP or APC. Most especially APC was disgraceful. If names and lists were appearing and the, and the, the National Party chairman was saying he has, he, has, he, has, he has the power to do as he wishes. And that was totally out of line with the constitution of the party. No guidelines was followed. Okay. So, 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 so the rule of law is what we are telling these political parties to have. One of all of most essential, essential is if you have a political party, you must have a database of your membership. Who are the members of APC? How many members are in, in Lagos? How many members are in Kusobe? How many members are in K2, for instance? So if the APC as a national party, as a winning party, cannot post and say that, yes, these are the membership base. And it okay. is on the basis of my membership that choices okay. are made I, I, for people who Shagun represent Akaba, them. I, I'm trying to, I, I think I get your point, I get the link, but I'm just uh, still concerned about where this problem started from. You believe it's also from the internal party mechanism. Yeah, Jide Benson, I understand you're back. I want you to finish your thought, and as you try to finish your thought, I also want you to look at how did this start? Is it part of the vestiges of the military rule that handed over power to the civilians in 1999, where we have so much money being entrenched to our public office holders at the detriment of a nation that is tagged the poverty capital of the world? Did you oh, yes, well, I quite agree. Um, okay. We're still living with part of the remnants, or if you like, leftover of the military government. Don't forget that um, the current president is also part of those people that you mentioned. And you can take a man out of the army, but you can't take the army out of the man. So we still see elements of that in the style of administration. Now, that said, now that said, um, there, there's the issue of lack of sincerity on the part of a lot of those who are in office on both on on every side but let's leave the judiciary out at this time so on the on the executive side and on the legislative side um until we see a lawmaker who at the end of the legislative year produces for instance an annual report inclusive of his constituency projects and the allowances earned and how they were disbursed then we can begin to say that we have true servant leaders Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much. So, Shegu Akabashoro, I'm just looking at, um, you know, how we can make sense out of this discussion because uh, I, 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 we've been talking about this cost of governance. Sometimes we even feel like, why are we still discussing it? But there is a move. There is a kind of movement that we noticed during the exactly. NSAS protest. And uh, people moved beyond just reforming the police and begin to ask for accountable governance. So if we are to engage in this discussion, how do we present our demands to our public office holders to say that both legislative, both, I mean, both legislative and the executive, let's cut down the cost. Just, just I will borrow Obama stamp. Let your vote count. Hmm. People who have organized answers have showed an exemplary leadership of how organization can be done successfully. And this is what we want for, from them, to start mobilizing, organizing on issues and teaching people how to make their vote count for individuals who will represent their interests. And they have to show that, that movement, that powerful movement of support, the numbers that they have, because this is a numbers game. So we have to play, we have to play the, the play, we have to play the political game as, as they speak. We cannot do this not child's play. The protest has come. Yes, we don't need protest over and over again. If you're going to have a protest, it must have a directed purpose at this time. Because the point has been made. Nigerians are angry. They are they are they are ready to explode. So if they are boiling. So we need to find another way to organize ourselves to make meaningful changes in our country and take over. This is a silent revolution can be made. So I'm going, to, I'm going to just urge that what we can do now, come 2023, is to start identifying those things that we want our representative to go and champion. And let us say we'll vote for those people that we can identify that can do so. Okay, if time permits me, I'll still come back for one more question to you. But Jide Benson, I've seen a lawmaker during campaign, or I don't know whether the person got uh, elected or not, and one of those lovely things that uh, 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 aspirants, you know, did say is that I'm going to be using half of my allowances to the people. I'll be giving it back to my constituents. And people were like, wow, this means that if you cannot change the cost of governance, you would divert this cost of governance to something meaningful. But beyond that, how do we have such kind of lawmakers across board so that we can say that, please, this money is too humongous for us. Let's use it for the development of our various constituents or constituencies now. So, um, Kade, you know that politicians campaign in poetry and govern in prose. <laughs> so that person was still seeking the votes of the people and it was convenient for him to make such a statement. Again, it goes back to the point I made earlier about legislative solidarity and legislative, uh, what do you call it, code of conduct. Because he probably knew ahead of time that if he, when he gets to the National Assembly, he won't be able to um, get the support of his colleagues to reduce the allowances that they earn. So he quickly sold a dummy to the electorate that, okay, I will collect these humongous allowances, but half of them will come to you. But I'm, I doubt if those constituents have tried to do a background check to know how much the person actually earns. So now back to the issue of getting the cost of governance um, reduced. I'm happy that um, the residue or some of the issues raised during NSAS is getting the attention in hollow chambers and in government houses. I mean, I think this is the third or fourth of such things that we are hearing. First of all, we've seen governors who are now trying to dispense with the idea of pensions for their predecessors and for themselves. Now, the issue of the allowances earned by lawmakers is coming up again. So if anybody thinks that the NSAS protest didn't succeed, I mean, the person might begin to have a rethink. So now going forward, I'm sure that, um, as Shegun Akapa Sharu said, said, by the time we're going to 2023, there are going to be more salient questions asked by the electorate. That when you get there, we're going to be, when you're, as you're going there, we're giving you a code of conduct that you would have to abide by. You probably have to sign it. The way people sign, the, the way aspirants or candidates sign peace accord a few days to the election. 
to the constituents, I mean, again, to align with Sheikh Mohamed Bashar, the constituents need to be more involved. They need to know a lot more about the activities of the legislative arms, how bills are sponsored, so that a lot more can even come from the, um, the constituents. Because I think that we are quite divorced from the legislative processes. A lot of us focus on the executive arm of government. We focus just a little on the um, legislative arm where the drama is happening. So people need to own the electoral process, know how laws are passed, know how, how bills are passed into law, and then hold the lawmakers accountable. I mean, almost in the last assembly, we almost got one person record, not on account of bad performance, but on account of the fallout that he had with the governor of the state. And I speak of Melai of Kogi State. Thank you so much. I, I quite appreciate your position. In other words, let people be involved. Let people know what they are doing. Let even people know their shadow in the legislative chamber. Thank you once again, Gide Benson. Akabashoru, I got a signal that I may not be able to take more questions. Thank you for your time. Um, Pleasure. We quite appreciate. Yeah, we'll I'm go. Honest. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Okay, and to our viewers, we'll take a short break now. And when we return, opposition party PDP takes steps to settle the conflict in the southwest of the party. We'll be right back after the short break. <laughs> 